how about the heat recovery Coke making milestones that you were able to achieve? Let's talk about those. So, uh, <laughs> it's a very interesting story. When there was an oil crisis, all these oil companies started buying coal companies also too. So, they bought this uh, coal company and they didn't know what to do with this uh, coke plant that is sitting in the next week. And after that, all the steel companies, US Steel, AK Steel, they all had that plant. And Boybud also, India started plant, Brazil started plant. The next uh, milestone is the non-recovery coke quality work at Sansi Coke plant in China. Now you will notice that a lot of work in China. So then since I was uh, in coal and coke, so I made sure that we will try different coals before you buy a coke. So we know that whether the quality that we're seeing these coals can produce or not. The process will produce it. It has its impact, but the coal also has to have, you know. So 70% of the properties are because of the coal. And, you know, and 30% are because of the process. Okay, so uh, as a result, I became very good in Chinese coal. We analyzed like unbelievable. I don't, don't even know, I can't even count. So anyhow, so during that kind of work, because in the blast furnace we saw degradation, we decided, man, this is the place. And as a result, Bill Embry and I, we got a US patent on that. So that's the in search of joint venture in coke making China. It sounds like you were able to achieve a lot in your career and were there for pioneering moments in the industry. So what kind of awards have you been given throughout your career? Okay, the first award immediately, this one meant a lot to us, is that when we did the CSF prediction model and applied it to the plant and the plant could see the benefit, so we got the AISI medal. And this is very interesting, you know, the medal was given at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel. And at that time, our management full team, full team, president, vice president, you know, research uh, uh, director, we all went there with our families. Can you imagine that to imagine that now, you know? <laughs> so we went there, we stayed in Waldorf Astoria, and then uh, received the award for that paper. Then next award was, I was really humbled to my coal that uh, very early, uh, I think probably maybe I was a younger person to receive the um, State Society's Joseph Becker Award, uh, which is given for new technological developments in coal carbonization and coal technology. And then the last one is the AIS Tech Joseph Capitan Coke Making Award for the best paper in 2006. And then I had, uh, with some other authors at Purdue University, we got a patent. And that patent was for how to produce oil and synthetic fuel from coal. So that was, patent was given in 2012. Then the last thing which meant a lot to me, I got an imminent visitor program that is sponsored by the Council of Scientific and Industrial Research Organization from Australia has invited to visit various universities, coke plants, steel plants, coal mines and labs. It was all arranged by Dr. Richard Sakharov from CSIRO in Australia. Next, let's talk about books or any contributions to books that you've made throughout your career. Okay. Uh, I am very proud of, you know, that AISI asked me to write a chapter at their website uh, www.steel.org uh, and there's this, on the right hand side there's a chapter there called Learning Center, how to make steel, you know, and in that how to make cook. So, <clears throat> And that's one. Then the second one, I wrote a book called Indiana Coals and the Steel Industry with uh, Dr. Maria Maslarez. And this was published by the uh, Indiana University and Indiana Geological Survey. And then I have contributed to some chapters in about nine books and course manuals. And the three that I would like to talk about, the first one is Making, Shaping and Treating of Steel from AIS Tech. And then the second one is called the Keystone Coal Manual. And that is, a, it's a huge Bible like a book, has names of every coal mine in America, 
their owners, their qualities, and then every state, the coal deposits. It's a huge thing. The last one is a book that came out in 2019. It's called New Coal Conversion Technologies. And I have a complete review of heat recovery, non recovery in that. Then besides that, there are manuals for courses that are taught in USA, Canada, Brazil, Argentina, and India. And these manuals have chapters. So, for example, every alternate year from the mid-1990s, I go to McMaster University and teach one hour lecture. Okay. And then uh, two hour lectures I have from Armistice Society used to have continuing education uh, in 1996-97, two times. So, uh, I have two hour lectures in that. And then one hour to one day lecture in various places. You know, but really, this one is important. That I, Dr. Ronaldo Sampaio, he is such a fantastic teacher, and he loves to spread knowledge. And so many students of his are everywhere. And, you know, so he arranged for a trip for me to come to Brazil, and they give a three-day lecture. So I gave it on heat recovery, everything you want to know about heat recovery, but we are afraid to ask. Let's switch gears and talk about AIME. I'd like to hear your thoughts on your involvement over the years, what you've gained from being involved, and why it would benefit new graduates to join. Okay. Uh, Dr. Dubhav, again, that's why I owe so much to him. He immediately asked me to join you know, our Institute Society. So I joined that at about 42 years ago. <coughs> And the biggest thing that happened there was that networking with cook makers, steel makers. And they were amazing people. They shared their wisdom. And they uh, shared with technological development that was happening in their plants, other plants, all of because we were new, young guys, you know. And then <coughs> they offered, this is the most important thing, they offered, you know, problem solving procedures that they adopted when they faced with the problem because we also would face those kind of problems, you know. So they had already gone through it and nobody was afraid. They would share like unbelievable, you know. And so that's, the, they genuinely were interested in the personal welfare of every member and of the society, okay. And so how am I giving back? I have regularly participated in the iron making, coke making program committee from mid 90s all the way up to like tomorrow. I'll be going for the committee meeting. Mm -hmm. And then I co chaired regularly uh, sessions from mid 90s to all the way to 2016. Now I'm not chairing because I want young people to know. Uh, <coughs> and then teaching short courses on that. So now I have a request to the executives of steel industry. I humbly request that they should really make visit to AST conference a must mandatory okay in the orientation program for new employees. No excuse. The moment they come, oh my God, it will open the whole world. So please don't deprive them of that. Now advice. Okay. <clears throat> I really want them to fall passionately in love with the pursuit of knowledge. The reason is that, very simple, that when you're passionate, it brings peace within. And when you have peace within, <coughs> it helps you to navigate through the storm that will be always, you know, rolling around outside. And you are able to sleep peacefully. When you get up, it shows on your face. And then it affects people around you. And you know what happens? Ultimately, all good things follow your path. And be humane. Humane. Because what good it is to achieve all the success in the world and in the process, you have lost the peace with it. That's very poetic. You know, you're an expert in 
the use of coal to make steel. We've learned that in our discussion here today. You're an expert. So I'd like you to share your thoughts on what's happening in the industry right now in terms of the industry's efforts to shift away from coal to reduce its carbon footprint. Okay. So I would, I would, I would define the efforts in two parts. One is the short-term effort, efforts and one is the long-term efforts. In short-term efforts, a lot of focus is going on in all the blast furnace areas because that's where the biggest carbon footprint is there. Okay, so and and, and everything is geared towards uh, increasing uh, basically uh, eff efficiency. You know, so improvement in efficiency. So, for example, you know, there are many. Just few examples: increasing the hot blast temperature. Okay, reducing the charge moisture, and then oxygen enrichment, and reduction in heat losses. You know. Many places there's too much heat lost also, so especially through improved refractories or the burden distribution, you know, uh, and there are many other process variables that people are working on. Then the next big thing is also going on is the use of HBI, hard briquetted you know, in the blast furnace. Because if you put that, then the pellet doesn't have to be reduced by the, the Cook, so you will have lesser cook to use. So that is also going on in the hard bucketing, <coughs> and then increasing use of natural gas for PCI. So if you use natural gas, then PCI, you know, obviously, you know, you can cut that off. And now another thing interesting going on is the use of CO2 neutral biomass or biochar and charcoal. And you will be surprised to hear that, you know, the Brazil is a leader in that and there are many blast furnaces that are running on charcoal and this biomass material, okay. So of course it requires very big planning, you know, you require 10 years of growing eucalyptus trees and uh, big management, somehow Brazil is doing it, right? okay. And then <coughs> uh, in the steel making, for the down there in the steel making, then you know increasing the use of scrap so that the the amount of uh, hot metal coming from blast furnace can be reduced and in the long term efforts you know so there are two big efforts going on in different parts of the world okay in the european union uh, is ultra low co2 steel making there are 48 companies that are joined there together in that and on the other hand in japan there is a Japan Aerospace Federation is going through a very big project. It's called Course 50. So next 50, uh, 2050, what will be the course? And these are a little bit different. Okay. So <clears throat> let me go through a few of them. So first one is a very important one: is the hydrogen injection into the blast furnace. So no coke, no coal. Okay, and not only that, no gas. Okay, so nothing, that, you know, that, <laughs> but the problem is that, you know, <laughs> it will require huge amount of CO2-free hydrogen and CO2-free electricity, big, big time, for the electrolysis and all that. Then the second thing that is going on is uh, exploring, you know, blast furnace gas that comes out, uh, converting the CO into it, into that is there in the, in the gas into CO2 and hydrogen by um, um, uh, uh, gas, uh, water gas reaction. Okay, so what will happen now you will have two streams. One is the hydrogen stream coming and another CO2 stream coming. Hydrogen, hydrogen stream can inject into blast furnace directly and CO2 stream you will have to think about storage or making chemicals from that. Now, there's also an effort going on, especially by um, Tata and Chorus in uh, um, Dutch um, Netherlands, and that is uh, coal based smelt reduction. So, basically, what the idea is that take fine ore, okay, and take ground coal. Why ground coal? Because you can use a low rank coal that is available, plenty, and cheap, okay. So, 
using those and of course then you can re uh, remove the ground coal with the biochar uh, CO2 neutral and this actually this process began uh, in Australia by it was called high smelt but now it's not working it, uh, actually it came from there but now it is called uh, with Tata Hasamarna uh, okay Hasarna Hasarna okay then uh, there's a gradual move uh, towards replacement of blast furnace gear put out completely hydrogen DRI. DRI made with hydrogen and electric arc furnace. Of course, then the question comes the scrap also too. You need to have high quality and uh, large amount of scrap and all that. So, <clears throat> and produce more steel. Okay. So, so, last one is all of these guys are exploring how to capture CO2, so carbon capture, utilization and storage. An um, uh, interesting example you can think about is that in uh, Iceland, you know, there is a um, steam plant, um, electricity generated and that uh, is CO2 um, gas uh, or emissions, they are fed into ground because the ground is full of basalt rock. Okay, and so there the basalt CO2 reacts with there with the calcium and forms calcium carbonate, which is limestone. And usually we think it's a long time it will take the geologic process, but no, they were able to do it pretty faster also there too. But that's there are different issues involved there too also. So it's not this so simple. <coughs> and <coughs> uh, now let's talk about Japanese. What Japanese are doing? So Japanese, what they are doing is called uh, Course 50. There are four steel companies that have joined that. And in that one, Nippon Steel, Kobe Steel, DIF, and Nippon Engineering. And what they are doing is that they want to keep the cook plant. Okay. So you have a cook plant here, and they already have come up with the cook plant. That is already uh, uh, the two plants uh, with Nippon Steel. They are called Scope 21. Okay, those plants are very effective and very different, very less emission and all that. So, and energy efficient. So, in that one, CO2 will be coming. Okay, so that will be captured and made into chemicals. Whereas the blast furnace, okay, will have hydrogen. So, what they are doing is this is very interesting. What they are doing is that they are working in the coke quality because coke will be reacting with hydrogen, not CO. So now they are working on making coke stand very high, but reacted to hydrogen. So they have a very different uh, project going on also. So basically, people are working on that. Steel plays a vital role in our everyday life, but I think people don't often realize that. They don't realize how ubiquitous steel is. So, how are you spreading this message to the citizens of the world? Okay. <clears throat> it's all related to coal to coke transformation under the microscope. You know, it just, I just go crazy looking at those you know, <laughs> carbon forms and all that. So, it's that intoxicating interaction with science that I want to tell everybody in the world. You know, just like Archimedes did, you know, ran from the, his tub. Of course, I didn't discover that kind of thing, but, but that kind of feeling I have. I want to spread it to everyone, know about it, you know, what steel companies do, what these products come from, dirty looking material, and, and everyday part of your life are being used, you know. Mm -hmm. It's unbelievable. Be grateful, you know, all these things, you know, the mother earth and all that. So I accomplished them by writing and through show and tell venues. In show and tell what I do is that I carry a set of iron ore, I have a nice one with a magnet, so when the kids see that magnet attaches there, and they wow, okay. So, <laughs> <laughs> and then a coal, a coke, iron pellets in a jar, and then a pig iron sample, and a tiny model car, a spoon, and a scissor. So I go through the whole system, how this scissor that stitches your wounds, the spoon that brings food into your mouth, 
you know, this car that you have gone everywhere to school and to vacations with your parent, you may hate it, but hey, <laughs> car is your. <laughs> Don't, uh, I know they are tired of hearing, are we there yet, but we love riding car, okay? So all that came from this black material, okay? Then I go through the whole uh, nice way, storytelling way. And then after that, I saw them. I, I have a beautiful collection of rocks and minerals, unbelievable. You know, I have a quad crystal, just one crystal by itself, this big, this big. So I give it to the kids, they love holding it. I have many crystals, unbelievable. Then I go to these and say, look, this is a beautiful crystal of fluorite. Fluorite and a teeth, so I have broken teeth. I like that, I tell funny, funny things, you know, mm -hmm. all that. The sulfur, uh, sample, oh, okay, this is the antibiotics, the sulfur is in that. So this is how I do that, all that. After that, then to keep their interest also, and to tell them about the bigger picture, I tell them the evolution of life, okay, in the history of geologic time scale. And I have wonderful collection of fossils. I have a fossil close to one billion year old. So I, I go through that and I say, look at this, look what, how it looks like the bacteria and you'll be very surprised the Minnesota where the iron ore comes from is about two billion years old but if you go slightly further to the north in Canada there's a place called Gunflint Church has got first bacteria about close to you know, two billion years old so we always tell the two places Bitter Springs in Australia Gunflint Church Gunflint Church in Ontario has the first organic impressions of cytobacteria. So I don't want to go into the other stories, but it is very interesting. I can tell you later on when we're done, it's very interesting, significant, you know, how life just started from there and all the gases, you know, uh, bad gases and all that, no oxygen, and those bacteria could thrive there, iron could deposit there. But then, after some time, oxygen came, how it came, how life evolved. You are as if you are watching a play in the middle, cotton rose, and you see life, but you have no idea what happened before. And that is what geology and making iron from minerals and the coal 300 million years old from Pennsylvania, Tennessee, how they combine and bring miracles in our life. And I tell these stories wherever I get a chance, whether it's a school, or a park, or a gallery, or a retirement community, or a boarding building in, in Gary, or a sidewalk in Highland. There are these stories written there. And uh, besides show and tell, I have some literary work where I try to relate to earth resources also. So, like for example, my first day of journey reporting the Inland Sea. I am going from this apartment in my car, you know, came from uh, opening college, very scared to drive car because I, you know, <laughs> I, of course, didn't have that kind of money to buy a car and all that in campus. So I would take a back road and I would describe geology because that bridge road is where the ice glaciers melted. And that was the ridge road where we are driving is the, is the shoreline of ancient Michigan Lake. And these kind of stories I wrote in that. So it's called Undeniably Indiana. And the Indiana University uh, published that book in celebration of the Indiana Bicentennial. So there are many funny stories like that in that. And then Indiana Writers Consortium, they asked me to write a blog for instilling love of science in younger minds which is published in there. Yeah. And the reason they asked me because I'm very actively involved with all these you know, literary societies. And of course, I did the same efforts in Hindi before coming to America. There's a children's book in Hindi written. It is called, uh, the title is a weird title, but what it means is that, uh, it means that journey to the Earth's interior. And there used to be a local newspaper in Nagpur. I used to write um, quite often for the science world there, you know, about our sciences. Now, the, one of the things that my giving back to society is that Indiana Bicentennial um, had a celebration in 2016. So, in commemoration, I wrote a poem. It's called Volcanoes of Northwest Indiana. 
which is basically our, our blast policies. And this was published and shared by the Indiana Bicentennial Commission in the newsletter. And also, thanks to Amanda, <laughs> <laughs> it was published in Iron Steel Technology in January issue of 2016. And uh, it basically highlights contribution of Indiana steel industry in uplifting people's lives. And still where we use is produced by somebody's loving hands and a person is behind every spoonful we eat. So Mother Earth gives us resources for the betterment of humankind. So extract and process it wisely in environmental friendly ways. So the poem is there, I'm not going to read it, but it's there, and one can find it. Now, besides celebrating Indiana Bicentennial, I was privileged to be part of the Inland Centennial Celebration in 1990. Inland Steel produced the book in 1990, and in that book describes the evolution of steel. In the cover page, they have three pictures. One is the workforce during the early phase, workforce during the middle phase, and then the workforce in 1990. And I was one of the persons in that picture. Now, at the end, this is the end. In the bigger picture of circle of life, uh, what is my oral history? But you know, it's in the bigger picture of life. And that is described in a poem. It's called I Remember. So I'm going to read this poem. It's a short poem. I remember sight of first monsoon planting a kiss on mud cheeks that instantaneously evaporated into sweet misty vapors spreading the scent igniting the heart, diffusing into every cell of my body. Since last three billion years, I am here, I am everywhere, carrying the scent and heart on fire. Thank you. Thanks to AME, AST for including me in the World History Project and my gratefulness to myself and the staff from AIME, and Chris McKelvey and staff from AST, and a bouquet of thanks to Amanda <laughs> <laughs> Blair for conducting the interview. Thank you, thank you. Well, thank you so much for that, and it has been an absolute pleasure talking with you today, learning about your life, and your love of the industry, and your love of poetry, and while, as I mentioned earlier, you are a coal expert, you are a poet at heart. We can see that clearly. <laughs> so thank you for sharing that poem. It was beautiful. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you, Michelle.